Three, welcome back. Hey, <laughs> it's Sonny Gara today. And I'm allowed. Yeah. Yeah. Last night on Chillin' Tuesdays. And um, I've found that I had another one of his books. So I'm going to read out of that. And he's also just recently uh, released a new book from Magabala Books um, Publishing in Broome in Western Australia. So uh, that's what I'll be sharing with you tonight. Now here we are in the Seahorse Medicine Cafe in Gaira. We've got a, a beautiful new tapestry up there. We've got a new stone horse there, a new little thing over here. And very soon we're going to have a proper heater in here to keep us all warm as well. And um, so a big hello to everyone out there in Facebook and YouTube world. And um, I'm going to break from tradition and not start with some uh, another poet's poetry tonight because I've actually written half a dozen this week. <laughs> um, again, I've started writing again, but only one today. Um, and this one, Steve, I wrote six days ago. I was inspired. Steve asked me to yeah. do it. Well, said he liked this one, so I'm going to do it. It's, in, it's a little blue blue whale just up on the wall. So that's the, um, the prompt. Little Penny Precious. Oh. Oh. <laughs> she wasn't that nice. You anyway, might see. Little Penny Precious had a great big dream. She'd catch a whale and make soap for the team. So she thought about it and made a plan to catch, bought a swimming costume and a plan was hatched. Little Penny Precious went fishing for a whale. Everybody told her that she was going to fail, but she had been eating an awful lot of kale. So she dived into the ocean and caught one by the tail. It was a mighty whale, you know, the kind that's blue. Penny Precious knew what she was going to do. She took a deep breath as the whale dived below. Descended very deep. It wasn't swimming slow. From within a pocket, she pulled an inflatable raft, tied it to the whale's tail, and that is when she laughed. As she pulled the cord to make the raft inflate, they both floated to the surface. It was the whale's fate. Little Penny Precious went fishing for a whale. She made it into soup and soap. But now she sits in jail. She succeeded when they said she was going to fail, but they probably should have told her it's illegal to catch and kill a whale. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah, save, save the, the whales. Mm. Yeah, all right. And um, so I'm going to move straight on to Alf Taylor's, one of his earlier books of poetry that he did in collaboration with Romaine Morton and Michael J. Smith. This was published by Magabala Books in, in the year uh, 1995. Alf Taylor's stuff was originally published in 92 and this book was published in, I don't know, yeah, 2000. But um, Alf Staff was 92, and that's where I'm going to be reading from tonight. And, you, and for those who have been here coming for a while, my other favourite one out of this one is by Romaine Morton, and it's um, the one called Barbie. Alright, this one's called Love. Let today be fine. Tomorrow it can rain. As I hold your warm body next to mine, your lips are inviting, your skin so soft and smooth, your smile ever so tender, as your hand clasped in mine, I could drink from your cup filled with so much love. Let it be fine as you gently press your lips to mine. Mm. Mm. A love affair. Mm. Come on in. Let life begin behind closed doors. Let our fantasies soar. A discreet meeting between two adults. A love affair that should not be there. 
I was the instigator, you were the participator. At times I feel this is not right. I am, so I am going to gently disappear from your life and silently glide back to my wife. <laughs> the petal softly the rose petal falls to the ground gentle breeze tosses it around and around uneven cobblestones tear at its skin bruised and battered it starts to cry, caught in the brush, that eventually dies. The flats. She left from here in quite despair, never more to return. These flats, she said, are driving me mad. With that bowed head, she whispers, yet <coughs> leaving my friends makes me feel so sad. Ooh. A dream shrouded by the darkness of the night. Your body so close, I wanted to hold you tight. I glanced at your face, it looked aglow. Your pouting lips, I wanted to get to know. A mist of sadness engulfed me as you got up to go. I woke with a start, yet again it seemed that you were only a dream. So yeah, some quite profound like little readings and I like the way particularly he sort of writes down the page in really short set like um, what do you call lines and, and breaks it up so you've got to give that emphasis to each sort of line that sort of yeah. And then the one here wins, which was, uh, this was again published by Magabala Books in Broome in 1994. Um, I'm only gonna, not going to read all of these out, but I've got a couple at the back here. So radiant. You look so radiant. You intoxicate me. Your beauty is a sight to behold. You are the natural wonder of God's own creation. I am not worthy of your beauty. If you take my hand, I will meekly abide with you. Over rainbows, through rain, through pain, through darkness, through light, your beauty, my thoughts, day and night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So radiant. Who wrote that? Elf Taylor. Why well, not him? Yeah, I do too. <laughs> I do. I've, I've fallen in love with this poetry just reading it out loud because it, it really has to be like read out loud to, to appreciate it. And, uh, you can actually see a whole lot from this book that I read out last night on the Facebook and the YouTube um, for the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. Yeah, all right. Well, that's actually me for the night. So I'm going to invite Ashley up if that's okay. Oh, that's all right. Yeah. Welcome up, Ashley Albanese. Oh, and tonight we've got, oh, Gabriel Dunleavy. Dunleavy is back. Have you got something for us, guys? Yes, I'm going to read from the night. Do you want me to get it for you? Yeah, yes, you yeah. can. Steve, you're coming up. Have you got anything, Vincent? Yes. No? Yes? yes. Woohoo! And Paul? 
later on. Right. At the end of the show. I've got to make that. Okay. And a coffee for you. Yes, please. Okay. Where's that chocolate? I don't know. Well, we've oh, got uh, uh, dynamic. Everyone's here. That's a wonderful word, isn't it? Dynamic. And I am not going to disappoint my perspicacious brain. Hypothesis, implication, and parameters of all that. See, I've got I've got three rulers with me here tonight. Three. Now, as fate would have it, there seems to be echoes of the western shores with us this evening. I um, am reading, or I am being read by, that's a family joke, I think, T.A.G. Hungerford's Stories from Suburban Road. He is a magnificent writer. I met his sister once in my shop in Griffith Street, Coolangatta, and she said, oh, I'm Tom Hungerford's sister, and I've been thinking about the five minutes I spent with her every week of my life for 40 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I always think each week when I think about her, what a great writer her brother is, and uh, how curious that she never left me, just saying to me across a counter nearly half a century ago, I'm Tom Hungerford's sister. So we were standing near the Pacific Ocean, and of course he's a writer of the... Uh, Indian Ocean world. Um, I will read in James's honour uh, a paragraph that comes from The Day It All Ended. Uh, Stories from a Suburban Road is a collection of his boyhood wanderings and wonderings around Fremantle and the West Australian bush. And the last story is The Melancholy Coming of War, that's an extraordinary essay into the hammer coming down that will never need a nail that is the coming of war. <coughs> and uh, <clears throat> the day it all ended starts with the realisation of what it means to be uh, potentially rubbed against that black oh, moustache that was yeah, Herr Hitler's calling that's sign. Yeah, right. that's and um, the main fellow goes off into the bush and he has this confrontation with a... Well, a seahorse. So we have connections with James Seahorses in Western Australia, it seems, tonight. He, he says as he's wandering around, It wasn't really cold. The wind off the land was loaded with the sweet dry grass and gum tree smell of And every few seconds, we swung around to let us know he was still on the job. I presume that's a uh, lot, yes. Right, yes. You may have seen it, I haven't. I have. The sand was like mother of pearl in the moonlight, soft, luminous between the black skeins and hammocks of kelp washed up by the blow. During the previous winter, I'd found a dead seahorse among the weed. I'd never seen one before, excepting in illustrations. It was so strange and beautiful, and in a way, secret. It knew things and had seen things I couldn't even begin to imagine. And as I looked down at it, the faint, salty smell of its decay drifting up to me, I felt as if I were holding all the secrets of all the oceans between my own fingertips. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. He's, a, he's, a great, he's a great writer, I obviously think so. And he wrote um, a classic work um, on the... Australian troops who struggled, as did my dad too, on the track called uh, The Ridge and the River, which all Australians should read. Now, I thought Gabrielle would be here tonight, and I dazzled him with my uh, three rules of hypothesis, implication and parameter. And as I finished this, sitting in my little gets, looking out over the lake, I thought, now Gabrielle will turn up tonight. So I can read this in his honour, and he did. Um, here goes. I did it with pencil and made it big because I was tired and cold, but pretending not to be in a creative tears. 
blocks off the cold and the pain. Well, Gabrielle, shining, shinning, riffing on your trumpet, exciting as you did, no doubt some nubile crumpet. Now, at God a time and place, allow that ruffled voice to tell the English tales that so entice, that's nice, close to our Aussie style, yet distantly embraced. Come now, bedeck the Gyra Poets Hall of Fame with those sardonic thoughts that frame our verb aplomb and leave us challenged by the endless seeking song of Gabrielle Aloft in flights between lectures flitting to the attic of his 60s London strictures Memories of what to do, what not to do, an embankment glow of what proof rock did not show. Now between the granite boulder bubbles, his mind's a wobble and a rumble. What epic ardours may bedeck the gyrostrata where in the snowy moonlight the lone horse ambles towards the mystery rider. Gabrielle perceives him at the next corner, gone just around, and puckers out his lips to trumpet out a rally sound, profound the rally sound, of due return, but knows will be in vain, for that lone footing horseman holds the bit and rein, at last accepting that all humanity attains, alas, Four words enjoys the jangling round the bit, where all mouths come down on form and set. The dawn is out there somewhere, if we can keep in step. Now to write a lecture on it, the horse and rider, somehow separated now, may yet have possibilities. Once more and yet again, into the blaze of sunsets, and yet, should be this line, may yet have possibilities reconnecting go. And once more, yet again, into the blaze of sunset. And the mouthpiece meets the lips. The blast is done. pro fitabilities. <laughs> Gabriel is a prophet. Mm -hmm. Now, to finish, to finish with uh, a song, a singy song, one of my favourite writers, who I never managed to bring his passion to my classrooms adequately, but I thought this would make a good song. I just have to ask Steve, what's a supper bin in a droving situation? A supper bin? Supper bin. Yeah. A supper bin. Well, it's a bin that's put out on the counter, and when the, all the drovers come in, they can get their supper out of it. So when he says in the last line, in kissing in the supper bin, oh, he's, well, I don't oh, know. he's relating <laughs> to those great chronic forces of food and lust, lust and food. So come live with me. He. Come live with me and we'll be drovers When stars are lambing in the rivers Couples count the sheep Yet kiss before they go to sleep All summer down the Lachlan side We'll sing like fancy as we ride Hawks hand charmed above the plain And shearing time comes in again For love of you I'll ring the shed We'll have breakfast served in bed by slattern maids in cotton caps and go to work at noon, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> oh, this, his song gets a lot of art and response here tonight, dear auditors. So, she replies, And in a basket I will keep the skirtings of the finest sheep. For spinning tight for ballet girls With combs and cutters in their curls And they will dance at each smoke hole For your delight upon the toe Bring your beer and violets In garlands for your gallon hats 
With mistletoe I'll crown, crown my hair And sing most sweetly to the air Since time's a shearer Where's the sin in kissing in the supper bin? <laughs> oh, I enjoyed that. Well, I might finish with one more, one more thing. I might finish with one more thing because it's humorous and uh, and who knows what coming from Francis Webb's pen. Oh my God, it's in another anthology. I've got the wrong one. Give me 20 seconds. Count backwards. No, must be the other. It must be the other, um, it must be the other collection. We're all grown old here. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. So, so I finished at a dead end tonight with a black swan leading white swans up the Peel River towards transcendence. <laughs> Must be the other end, so yeah. 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 I enjoyed it too. That's the point, isn't it? Good. Would you like to try that? Sure. So I'll do one and then I'll move you up. Sure. All right. That's a warning. Top big warning. Um, after after Vincent, then Gabriel. After Gabriel, uh, Gladys, Steve, Paul. Uh, Killer whale. Well, on that um, note of whales before, I, the little Penny Precious got a blue whale and a bit later in the day I was thinking about a killer whale. Um, a killer whale was feeling ill. I don't feel like I can kill, I think I'll start eating krill and eat until I've had my fill. A killer whale, whose name was Bill, started eating lots of krill, but he could never eat his fill because Bill was a bit of a dill. A killer whale was feeling ill with hunger pains, he couldn't fill his stomach with enough krill, so Bill went to the beach and ate Jill. <laughs> Bill was hungry and had to kill a swimmer at the beach named Jill and another man who was named Will. Now, Jill and Will are both in Bill. The krill was now safe from Bill and he was happy again to kill. The main thing was Bill had his fill of a swimmer named Jill and also Will. Oh. <laughs> Tragic. Yeah, what, a sad, I, what a sad story. <laughs> oh, no, no. Well, not for Bill, he was happy. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm from, yeah, from what do you call that? Kill the wild side of these. Ethnocentric Australian perspective. Uh, perspective. Yeah, it's just very sad for Bill and Jill and Will. Anyway, but um, Vincent, okay. come on up. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. 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 Hi there. How are we? Hi. Well, <laughs> I'll stick with the old seafood thing. <laughs> Get a sense. I have a joke. Okay. Mr. Squid wasn't feeling really well one day, and he's in the water, and Mr. Sharp swims past and says, Hello, Mr. Squid, how are you going? He goes, I'm not feeling very well today. So Mr. Shark says, How about I take you for a ride? And it might make me feel better. He goes, OK. They start swimming along and they bump into Mr. Turtle. And Mr. Shark says, Hello, Mr. Turtle, I've got the six quid I owe you. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, that's pre nineteen sixty six. Oh, definitely. <laughs> now that's Chuckles Whitley. Was it? Chuckles Whitley. Yeah. I get told them jokes on the back of a fishing trawler. Quite funny. Well, I'm not taking the glasses off now to read. Here we go, Joe. Now. This is picked out by Susan. It's called Tid Bits and it's by... I'm sorry, disclaimer, I opened the book and it was there. <laughs> <laughs> I opened the book, it was that page or that page. That's yes, that's true. true. <laughs> but I did want to read Teenager No More. Maybe for a while. So we put Tid Bits. Okay, here we go. 
We all like to prod and poke, seek out the sweet morsels of life. Some like staying with the safe things they know and feel sure about. Others go for it. Heart before head, impulsive creatures whose whim is fully is fulfilled by the tasty bits. How some crave for those parts of life which give us pleasure. Such a lovely way to spend time with a special friend, masticating together. What? Oh, oh, masticating. Oh, right, they have, they taking have, it easy. No being there. Relaxing <laughs> back. And all the other things. <laughs> right. But let's skip the dress and offer, discover the other sweets elsewhere. Okay. Good on you, Meredith. Made no sense to me at all. <laughs> but it's not very new to you, because I couldn't write that. Okay then, that's me over and out. Oh, Larry, Yahoo, mate. Hope you're yes. doing well. Good one. Yeah, big shout out to Larry down there. He was in Cough Steve, isn't he? Mm, yeah, yeah. I have yeah, some for mm. the news. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, anyway, Larry's been a bit crook, so our, all yeah. our hearts go out and love go out to Larry out there. And I hope to see you here soon. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, back, back. And uh, maybe James might make his way up. I don't know. Who knows? Oh, yeah. Know. Yeah, long, James. Too far away. James Long. No, no, Long James. other James. Yeah, Long James. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. James Adam. Yeah. All right. Well, um, quickly advertising what's happening here in the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. On Wednesday night, we have Wednesday Words Open Mic Poetry Night. Ooh, That's the night. Yeah, yeah, so you get along. Uh, on Saturday morning, we've got the market here from 8.30 to 12.30. And I think this week we've got the Freemasons doing the sausage sizzle barbecue. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the in the morning, and on the thirtieth of July, we've got the Vanuatu Independence Day celebration. That's a Saturday night uh, from I think about five five thirty. I'm not too sure of the exact time there yet, but that'll be another fantastic evening of um, good island food and dancing and music and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and then Tuesday nights, I'm still doing my Tuesday, Chillin' Tuesdays poet cast from this little chair behind me. Hmm. On that note, then, I'll move along and invite Gabriel Donnelly back up for you. Uh, through Indonesia and other places. Yeah. No, thanks, James. Um, hi, everybody in here and out there. Um, I have been away for six weeks in Indonesia, which was boring because it was closed on account of the G20, and you never know uh, who might be hanging around waiting to assassinate Putin, at least that's what they told me. Um, and uh, then I had an accounting conference in uh, Sardinia, and Sardinia was nice, the conference was shit. And, <laughs> and, um, As accountants do. <laughs> on my bucket list, has always been Sicily, so I went to Sardinia via Sicily, and uh, I hired a car in Palermo, and I've now got enough material to write um, a follow-up to uh, Dante called Dante's Palermo, and uh, <laughs> watch this place. Um, while I was away, I wrote, I wrote a few things, um, including some uh, songs, which I'll do when I've got my trumpet, because my trumpet's obviously very popular for all the wrong reasons. Um, I thought... I really like when James does his fantasy animals and goes all mad. And why don't I try and do that? So um, I sort of meditated and had a dream and all that. And, I, tr and um, I tried to do that. But listen to what came out. This is called Africa and Asia, a different history fantasy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I dreamed I rode a horsey fant. It's trunk a metre long. It's whinnying exultant. Its hooves rotund and strong. We had come from fighting back Scipio's Roman army. Carthage Horsifant's attack had made his horses balmy. Now will come a better way for European folk, freed from Roman's cruel sway and cruel religion's yoke. 
I dreamed I rode an Eliphaz across, a cross-wide marathon and slew young Alexander, great wonder boy of Macedon. My home was Sepolis, protected. Plato won't enslave thinkers unsuspected. Their empty word democracy, Greeks proclaim, as Greeks proclaim their rule, hides beneath it tyranny. Elected are selected. Double talk, a Greek invention. Plato, Aristo and Xander, all now buried and dissolved. No saviour, thanks to Panda. We will be just what we are, see what we really see, with no pretended inner truth, no fraudulent agency. So I started off trying to be manic and funny, and look how I ended up. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean more and more serious as it went along. I started to play that movie like that. On the other hand, sticking right in myself. The other, the other uh, one I just did. Uh, tonight because it doesn't need uh, any music and it's uh, sort of completely different, um, was supposed to be uh, serious and it didn't come out entirely that way. I was thinking, why would um, these great big movie magnates and people like Einstein and for that matter earlier on Woody Allen, why do they get themselves into such sexual trouble? Haven't they got enough? Why... Uh, why are they like the way they are? There must be something about the way they think about sex, entitlement and women that isn't the same as what the rest of us think. And so I thought, mm. I wonder what it is. And so here we go. And this one's called Harvey Weinstein's Utility Company. My name is Harvey Weinstein. I'm a mogul, as you know. I made blockbuster movie greats. I made stars and took off bras and I made loads of dough. <laughs> now I'm sulking, languishing in a high security jail just for taking low laid fruit from the odd female. I'm in jail for being born a normal human male. I don't understand the scorn I get beyond the pale. In my view, and I'm not alone, sex is a public utility like water, roads and wires for phones. To deny, to deny that is futility. I am a fair man, not too fussy, and touch makes the world alive. In every town, a public pussy is the goal for which I strive. What of me too, you may well ask. Like I said, I'm fair. So we must accept the task of equalising care. Women too, we need not mock, shall have their rights defended. There must be a public cock with condom always mended. Ah. <laughs> ah, yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh, the correct. <laughs> Andy Rex. Picnic table sits the head of a prawn. <laughs> the exquisite, tiny, frosty ice crystal castle glistens everywhere. Biggest frost so far. Puddles frozen solar today. In the playground, the soft fall is as slippery as ice. It is ice. Every blade of grass up the trees, car windscreens frozen. I hope you've added antifreeze to the radiator fluid. It's a good idea. Uh, a spatula to clear the windscreen. You did think about that one. Mm. Doors frozen shut. And here I am, frozen fingers fidgeting on a phone. 
thinking about Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker, Vivaldi's Four Seasons, Winter of course, and Disney's Frozen, Superman in his Ice Palace, Jack Nicholson freezing in the snow, The Shining, and here comes a saber-toothed tiger and a woolly mammoth. It's the Ice Age. Okay. And on that, I'm going to invite another song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And read out of uh, Myra Sweeney's book tonight. No, yeah, no, who? Myra Sweeney, is it or? Uh, yeah, yes. Myra Sweeney, yeah. I'll just, uh, I'll just move over here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it comes to when I'm at it. Right, okay. Yep. Well, good evening, everyone. It's lovely to have you in here and also out there. Uh, this is my. Second poetry reading this week. I was invited to read poetry for the Fabus group at the Bowling Club Ooh. on Monday. Oh. We also have another uh, booking for the HAC, the Home and Community Services, on the 10th of next month, where I've also been reading poetry. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, um, but yes, it was enjoyable on Monday. But anyway, it's lovely to have all you guys back and a wonderful team again. Yeah, I'm back on the old team. Uh, I wish Larry and Doug all the very best and hope they are both with us very mm -hmm. shortly. Um, but at any rate, I'm going to read this one, uh, Armadale. High up in the ranges, nestled in a lovely bay, stands our modern city, the city of Armadale. For its colleagues and schools, it's so well renowned. At the garden city, no better will be found. The lovely set of roses of, of, different, uh, of every different hue and the pretty hydrangeas in shades of pink and blue. Fill the gardens with their colour, again leaves and vivid green, and many other pretty flowers are also to be seen. When daylight fades in quiet surrender to the night and all is still, you can see the city in its splendour from the lookout on the hill. The dancing lights shine brightly from every street below to embrace the quiet surroundings and a warm and friendly glow. No smoke and soot from factories to spoil the clean, fresh mountain air. No rushing, hurrying crowds with never a minute to spare. The wattle blooms profusely out on the northern hill while the south of the apple blossom, the fields and fragrant fill. The beauty of the mountains where tranquility and peace prevail lend serenity and charm to the beautiful city of Armadale. Mm. Yeah, so I'm hoping um, that I have my new one. Uh, our bushland calling is coming up. I wrote a lot down this afternoon. I put them up together. And it's on um, the fires, our huge firestorm that was back here earlier, and on the smoke and all of the burnt stuff and all that, but yes, it's coming up, so probably, but I've got to have that finished by the 10th of next month, because that's when I've got to do it at the Home and Community Services. So, yes, yeah, so we've, uh, that's what I've got to do, and then, of course, uh, after that, well, I think the lamb and potato, I will also be reading poetry there, so, yeah, I'm booked in there, so, yeah. Okay, well, thank you, and it's lovely to you. Okay, so we've only got Paul over here to go. So before we do another winter one or a funny one, I do a winter one. This was yesterday because I'm friggin' well fed up with people complaining it's cold here because it's cold. And get over it. Take a spoon of concrete and harden up. We know it's cold. You don't have to tell us. All right? No, you don't. No, you don't. No different but difference between the hot and the cold. Yeah. yeah. If it was hard, why? No difference. <laughs> Winter will pass. Uh, actually, this is inspired by the great public motivational speaker Jim Rohn. Winter will pass after frost. 
ice and snow and cold westerly winds whip, whistle and blow, for now I will sip hot chocolate from a glass, then run to get warm knowing winter won't last. Green shoots and dahlias bloom in the spring, baby birds singing, ducklings learning swimming. I could watch the birds and flowers for hours, interrupted by growth bringing spring showers. The bees buzzing for cicada choirs screech, summer sunset days at the bush of the beach, flies and mosquitoes. Then an afternoon storm, thunderclouds approaching, greening the lawn. Red, orange, brown, yellow, autumn leaves fall. Hear the last of the leaving wild ducks call. Let us fly north, because winter comes soon. May is quite chilly, but nothing like June. As sure as the sunrise, the seasons will pass on, continuing forever after you're dead and long gone. Gather grain in the autumn and store it air tight as sustenance during the long winter nights. Winter will pass after frost, ice and snow and cold westerly winds whip, whistle and blow. For now I will sip hot chocolate from a glass, then run to get warm knowing winter won't last. Mm. Yeah, I was trying to um, evoke like the colours and the visuals of the seasons with that, so I hope I did. Yeah. Okay. Um, on that note, have we got Paul? Ooh. All right. Okay. <laughs> No, you're welcome. <laughs> 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 you lost it. All right, all right. Screaming, he's jumping up and down. He's telling other people to have sex with other people. He's jumping through the kitchen and he's screaming about people's pineapple fritters. And as he's jumping around, he gets his nuts caught in a waffle iron and his dick caught in a blender. He hates that. Jeez, he hates that. And and you know what else he hates? Going to the opera. <laughs> and that what else he hates, James? We just lost our G rating. <laughs> well, you know what else he hates? He hates it when he goes down on ATM machine in Gaia and uh, he puts a card in it, throws the card out and says you're broke. And, and he does what normal people in God do, kicks the shit out of the machine and walks away with his card and then suddenly the machine spits out $30,000, he gathers it up and takes it home and when he counts it's only 29000 jeez he hates that, that happens all the time, no, jeez he hates that. And, and, do you know, you know what he hates? What does he hate? Well, he hates it when he goes to the Guy Republic bars and he steps off in the gentleman's changing room and he walks past a wall mirror and 
he sees beautiful muscles, chiseled muscles, big shoulders, gorgeous sexy legs, and a portion like a Shetland pony, and then he just realises it's a hole in the wall, it's another fella, he hates that, yes he hates that, no he hates that, that happens all the time, he hates it. He needs to go to the opera. Are we adjusted, sir? Are we adjusted? Yeah. Are we adjusted? Yeah. All right. Now, this is my comeback show. My comeback show. I haven't been away as long as the professor, but I've been away. Circumstantial. And I haven't got much prepared tonight, but uh, I will talk about the book that my sister sent me, Julie, the story of Sam Phillips. Very interesting man, uh, professor. Born in 1922. Self-made guy, come from a very poor part of the South. The people in the South were more or less disenfranchised like the black people. The white people were the same. Everything was owned. They were sharecroppers and poor. Very honest Christian people, but uh, they were dotted. They, they didn't live the American dream as, we, as, as the people in the East Coast did. There was a separation through poverty. Poverty was inclined. Maybe it was a natural poverty after losing a war. But... Sam grew up in that period, and he recalls that he was a, what they call a depression child, and talked about the times there as sharecroppers. They shared the land along with black farmers too. They are very highly associated in their, in their church and in their way of life, and Sam was very influenced by that. And he decided to set up a recording studio in Memphis <coughs> to record black people because black artists were the separation and segregation in the South at that time never got an opportunity, they couldn't go to places. But Sam broke the rule to some extent and record these people. They would take home a small acetate so that people could hear them, themselves sing or do something. And, of course, uh, Sam discovered Elvis Presley. And, as I said, it was very serendipitous. But as I read the book, I had a general knowledge about it. It was very interesting from his perspective. And... The problem he had was the, the, the standard problem of undercapitalisation business. He had the artist, he was producing records that were selling, but to get the records pressed, he was always in debt. And then he had the problem as a small distributor that when he would take the records out to the record shops and jukebox operators, if they didn't like the record, they sent it back. And he was broke, he was perpetually broke. So he had a, he had a guy who was going to be a world hit or so it seemed, but he couldn't afford, he was in the debtor's trap. And he sold, in uh, 1955, he sold Elvis's contract to the Colonel. Now, I didn't know much about the Colonel, but in, in the biographer's words, and by the way, the fellow that wrote the book spent 25 years with Sam, became a friend of Sam Phillips, and an acolyte, spent a lot of time with him, and it was after 10 years after Sam's death that the book was published, so it's very very intense, very well thought out, uh, not a sensational biography, very, very accurate at the time. And selling, selling uh, Elvis's contract meant that he could be capitalised to promote his new artists, which was Johnny Cash, Carl Perkins, Roy Orbison, B.B. King, and a whole host of other people that went other places. So in essence, uh, this fella, well, he didn't really discover these people because because of his unique position and because of the character that he was, people came to him to get recorded and it so happened that those people became very famous pop stars. Anyway, I've got to thank Julie again for the book. Um, I've read the whole thing, it's 700 pages, quite a big read. Did he get a reasonable deal out of the Colonel or was it He really did. Bad? Well, well he what did. happened, uh, people have looked back, as people do. When people look back, they say, well, I could have bought a block of land for five quid. I could have, you know, all that sort of stuff. You hear that yeah. rhetoric stuff. I've heard that all my life. Uh, everything, mm -hmm. everything has a market value in the day on the time. And generally speaking, everything is too expensive in the day. When people look back, they realise it's too cheap. But that's, that's the fault of, of, of human beings. 
So, but Sam was sold about that because, to put into perspective, um, Frankie Lane, who was a huge recording artist, that re that 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 had appeal on both sides of the of, of America. America was two countries, and to have appeal on both sides of the country. Stay with it. Stay with it, Steve. Won't be long. Yeah, right, man. Uh, <laughs> to have appeal on both sides of, of the coast, you had to be generally a pretty sort of a, a middle of the road artist. And Frankie Lane, who was a big recording artist, then his contract sold for twenty thousand dollars. Now, when Elvis started to get hits through Sam's great recording, the Sun recording sessions, the Colonel. Now, the, I didn't know this, but the Colonel already had Eddie Arnold, a very, very prominent country singer that had a pearl on both sides, a crooner that had a pearl on both sides of the country, and he had Hank Snow. So he wasn't an amateur. He did actually have fairly high-level uh, artists that he owned. He had their contract. And, of course, what he would do, he would have them... He owned them, but they would, he would then do records with the major labels. Now, the major labels could distribute America-wide and worldwide. Sam couldn't do that. So, when, in Sam's desperation, because he was on the verge of bankruptcy, he was work, working 20 hours a day, he was falling asleep at the wheel, he was taking the records out to try to shoot him in the, in the boot of his car. So, when the Colonel put on him, he asked for an extraordinary amount of money for an artist contract. Remember, Elvis might have just fizzed out and never heard of him again, as most artists, most recording people do. And he... He insisted on $35,000 at the time, in 1955, for Elvis's contract, but, <clears throat> but he also demanded $5,000 in royalties to Elvis, which, which was typical of Sam, because he's such a generous and honest guy. He, he, didn't, he didn't date anyone. And Elvis remained a very solid friend after the, after the contract was sold, a family friend till the end of his life. So Sam got $35,000 and that released him to build a new studio to be able to promote and pay his new artists. <coughs> and by the way, his next big artist was uh, Carl Perkins. And Carl Perkins' uh, big records sold a million when Elvis was only selling 50000 So it looked like RCA had signed the wrong guy. But of course, Elvis was greatness. And the Colonel too. And maybe if the Colonel had never signed Elvis and it never happened, we would never have heard of Elvis Presley. Very likely. So there's, there's a lot to it. It's very interesting from that perspective. But Sam insisted all the way through that he was very happy with the deal he got. Totally happy. He'd done, he'd done the right thing for Elvis, the right thing for his other people, mm -hmm. and it saved him from, it saved him from bankruptcy. Which people have to do. So, I mean, how do I put it? If you can look back and say, well, all sorts of millions of dollars. Now, Sam never, ever, never had no regret about that. And he, had, he had no regrets for anything. And, and during his whole life, he was badly taken down by a lot of his artists. Johnny Cash abandoned him. Uh, Carl Perkins, they signed other places. He lost all his great artists, you know. So, he had a bad time, but he had a philosophy never to hold a grudge and never to say a bad word about people. So, it was a very interesting uh, uh, study on a man of his time who was, who was uh, uh, um, shall we say, uh, ahead of his time maybe, or in futures. When he realised that being an independent record maker had no future because they had no means of distribution. No means of distribution. And the moguls, the big record companies, could annihilate them one by one, and they did. All the small independents were sold out. Sam would never sell out to an independent, as an independent record maker, he wouldn't sell to the major labels. He always remained independent because that was his philosophy. And, and through the, the, the possibility of getting a lot of money, he didn't bend his principles. He's an old fashioned guy, yeah, right. mm. everyone knows that, don't they? Mm. All right, now I'm going to recycle a song only just to keep you all entertained because. You're all sitting there like penguins, you're waiting for something good that the night. Oh, for sure. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do Mama Choi, do, do a, do a, do a, um, uh, Jesus. Mel Haggard. I'll do a Mel Haggard song. First thing I remember, none. 
Was a lonesome whistle blowing, a youngest dream of growing up to ride. But a freight train leaving town, not knowing where I'm bound, no one could change my mind but Mama try. The one and only rebel child from a family thick and mild, my mama seemed to know what lay in store. Spotting all my Sunday learning, to the bad I kept on turning, to mama couldn't hold me anymore. <laughs> and I turned 21 in prison, doing life without parole. No one could change my mind, but mama tried, mama tried, mama tried to change me better, but a bleeding I denied. It's only me to blame, cause mama tried. <laughs> Dear old daddy, bless his soul, let my mama head low. She tried so very hard to fill his shoes. Working hours without rest, wanted me to have the best. She tried to raise me right, but I refused. I turned 21 in prison, doing life without parole. No one could steer me right, but Mama tried, Mama tried, Mama tried to raise me better. But a pleading I denied, that leaves only me to blame, cause Mama tried. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Merle Haggard. Thank you very much. Oh. Those things he hates, I don't know. Ah, no. No. How about that? All right, well, we've got one, one last poet to come on up, and then myself. So, Steve Wordsmith, welcome oh, back. Oh. See you last week. Oh, wow. Hello, everybody out there. I really want to say hello to everybody that looks on to the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame here on Wednesday night open mic. It's, um, you know, we, we go to many places. I'd like to say to Lorraine, hello, and Buttercup over in Ireland. And I'd like to say to Will in, in Paris, hello, how are you going? I'd like to also well, say hello to Larry down the, down the track down there because I've been visiting him and he's been a bit crook. Have you sent and them our new um, page? No, I haven't. Okay. So we, we, we need to do that. Mm. When the fires of inspiration are ignited and the poetic words start to flow. Like the rapids in the mountain and the imagination grows, don't damn the flow of magic. Be inspired by every word. Let's use the words we are given to instigate the change of logic that is needed in these times and voice the inspiration from our inner, higher self and realise our real eyes and know that we have got this. Be inspired by every word. I, I want to call out to the De Bono family just today. Um, I, I had the great privilege of, of um, doing poetry for Paul, a good friend of mine who passed on about six months ago. And his brother passed on two days ago. Paul and Tony De Bono are my mates. They have just left for the pearly gates. Better blokes you wouldn't find around this land. They've travelled plenty. Paul has just gone to find his mate called Lenny. We know we will meet in another time, telling tales, yarns and rhymes. But until we find the mob again, we will keep on partying with our friends. With memories of the eyes of years gone by, the boys are watching from on high. Many tales have not been told, but I know we will get around the eternal fire with a bathtub full of long neck beer and bongs galore. We will party till the end of time. I know there's no women in this rhyme, but fuck them all. For another time, this is a tale of a bunch of mates just partying hard behind the pearly gates. Oh. You know, to me, we celebrate life. And these guys are great lives. You know, I, I sort of went and... It was interesting. Paul was this guy about this big, about that wide, you know. And, uh, you know, the, the priests were saying all sorts of things about him and all that, forgive him and all that sort of thing. And I said, listen, man... The reason he had such a big chest was because he had such a big heart. And it says in the scriptures, you'll know your brothers by the way they treat their brothers. 
and he treated everybody pretty well. So I reckon he's a pretty good bloke, anyway. Mm. So hello to all the Debonos, and um, see you later to Paul and Tony. See you next time. I'll meet you on the other side. Yeah, yeah meet you on the other side, mate. Mm. Hallelujah. Yeah, many years ago I uh, was up at Expo, and uh, I, I told a tale, and it inspired my younger son at the time, or my older son at the time. And uh, it's led to an interesting life. Near the rambling Richmond River where the ghosts of cedar barges rise from derelicts and skeletons, telling tales of years gone by, of the early cedar cutters who braved the coastal ranges to reap the valued harvest at the massive forest side. But the years have passed so quickly, and the banks are now near barren, through the mighty Richmond Valley from Nashua down to Korokai, and the river seldom used now for transport or for pleasure, and the water's brown and mud-stained as the land gives up the fight. From years of torrential downpours that's caused the land erosion and floods that stole the topsoil that the big scrub held in place, where once there was an abundance of the fighting Richmond black bass, now from the murky muddy waters comes the catfish and the eel. Yes, the Richmond's only one place in this wondrous world around us. The man has taken over and he's stirred the flame and pot. But he'll wreak his just desserts though when he plays with Mother Nature. And she says the game's now over and starves the bloody lot. Now, you know, these are interesting words, and, and in the time, this was a 12-year-old boy's uh, perception when he heard it, and it got him into a life of activism and such, and I'd just like to call out to my oldest son, Hawk, Firehawk, hello. I hope all things work out good, man. Yeah, with you. Yeah, thank you for having me back here again. It's always good, you know. When the God of all creation sent his one, his only son, I wasn't even thought of when they said he was the one. When he turned the water into wine or he touched the blind man's eyes, when he walked upon the waters, it was way before my time. And the thorns were digging in his head and they spat upon his face with eyes so deep he looked at them and he shone with all his grace. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. And even back 2,000 years, you're thinking of us. Then. Ah. See, it's all a tale of a river. It's told by a man in a dream. The dream was inspired by the sovereign and it's a blessing for you and for me. This river, it enters the ocean. The fresh washes away the saline and the brine. The stagnant waters start flowing. And there's creatures of many species and kind. On the banks of the river grow orchards, fruit trees of many a kind. And they'll produce on a monthly basis as the fresh replaces the brine. You can paddle in up to your ankles, you can wade in up to your knees, but it's better to go right in to be purified <laughs> and cleaned. <laughs> Some say he was an outlaw and he roamed across the land with a band of unskilled ruffians and a few old fishermen. No one knew from where he came or exactly what he'd done but they thought it must have been something bad to keep him on the run. Some say he was a poet, he made a stand upon the hill and his voice could calm an angry crowd and make the waves stand still. He spoke in many parables that few could understand and people sat for hours just to listen to this man. Some say a politician because he spoke of being free. He was followed by the masses on the shores of Galilee. He spoke loud against corruption and bowed to no decree, but they feared his strength and power, so they nailed him to a tree. Some say he was the son of God, a man above all men, but he came to be a servant and set us free from sin. And that's who I believe he was, because that's who I believe. And if you believe in J.C., it's almost time to leave. See, when we open up our eyes to realise the real eyes and realise the real lies, there's plenty of real lies. And if we get bound into the religious dogmas of things and we don't open up our eyes to the real realities of what's happening in this world, because there's many changes, and the only thing that's constant is change. And we're in a time of train, change and transformation from a place 
of third dimensional thinking to fifth dimensional thinking. So you have a lovely day and it's always good to be here and may it be a better place because poets are in it. Have a lovely day. But you believe in dog, you will have a best friend for life. Woof. It's true. Yeah. You've met his friend. Um, right. This is a lead in to my next one, which is a little karaoke from a follower who only lived to like 57, he died in 2016. This is Prince, it's the reggae version. <laughs> I never meant to cause you in this sorrow. I never meant to cause you any pain. <laughs> I only wanted to see you laughing. I only wanted to see you laughing in the purple rain. Purple rain, purple rain. <laughs> purple rain, purple rain. Come on, everybody. <laughs> Purple rain, purple rain. Yeah, I only wanted to see you laughing. Ready? I only wanted to see you laughing in that purple rain. I never wanted to be your weekend lover. I only wanted to be some kind of friend. Baby, I can never steal you from another. a shame our friendship had to end purple rain purple rain yeah we're an expert of this purple rain purple rain purple rain purple rain you ready I only want to see you laughing in the purple rain I only want to see you laughing in the purple rain Sometimes you're changing. It's time we reach out for something new that means me and you too. Well, yeah. you can make up your mind to let me guide you to the purple rain. Purple rain, purple rain. Purple rain, purple rain. Purple rain, purple rain. I wonder what it's ready. I only want to see you laugh, see you laugh again. Purple rain. Okay, well then I'm just going to stop it there because that's going to lead into the next. So, who was that? I don't know. I don't know. All right. <laughs> So, why don't oysters donate to charity? Because they're shellfish. <laughs> <laughs> why, why is COVID a bad criminal? Because it's easy to catch. <laughs> How does a, a penguin build a house? It glues it together. <laughs> <laughs> which, which knight invented King Arthur's round table? Not me. Circumference. <laughs> <laughs> what do sprinters eat before the race? Nothing, they fast. <laughs> okay, so yeah, on that, um, if the rain were purple, I'd only want to see you laughing. But I'd like to see you laughing also when it's dry. If the snow were rainbow confetti, I'd also like to see you laughing. And no matter what the weather, I'd want to see you cry. I'd love to take a feather and tickle you on the brain. If the rain were purple, I'd stand in a glass of yellow 
in a glass box of yellow jello, wearing yellow socks and jocks in the purple rain, yelling to the compu morning commuters, Hello, I'm in yellow jello. I only want to see you laughing. I don't want to see you cry. Even if I was trampled by a giraffe, I'd only want to see you laugh. Because that could be an unusually funny way to die. I want you to laugh if I got trampled by a yellow giraffe. Oh. <laughs> that's it. Oh. See, that, that reminds me of the, um, the, the, three, the three Buddhists, the laughing monks, that they were famous. They travelled around China and every town that they went into, they would laugh. They would stand in the middle of the square and they would just laugh, like, ha, 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 ha. And then they would laugh and laugh and people would gather around and more and... And then suddenly it was infectious and everyone was laughing and anyway, so they became famous far and wide and they travelled everywhere anyway. One day they went into a town and they laughed and, and laughed and laughed and anyway they woke up the next morning and one of them was dead. You woke up dead? No, you didn't wake up. Oh, One was dead. The other yeah. two woke up. Someone put a sock in. So they went outside and they were laughing. The two, two living ones were laughing and laughing. And someone walked up to them. And they said, but your friends just died. Yeah. They said, yeah, because just yesterday he said, wouldn't it be funny if I died tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, yeah, we do, we'll pass on, and I know Steve's lost some good friends, so yeah, sorry about that, Steve, and, um, and, um, yeah, oh, we're, so, nice. so is Ashley, and, yeah, yeah and, and many people in this last few years, too. Months. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, I've got, I've only got one left to do, and it's about Panda Mick. Not a pandemic this time, but it's actually a panda called Did you Mick. say pandemic? Oh, no, sorry, no, no, a panda no, no, no. Okay. And, and it's actually got a little bit of, um, a little, like it was a bit inspired by me. Um, because, like, I, I haven't got a confession to make because I pleaded guilty. I, I don't need to confess. Um, <laughs> but back in... <laughs> Um, back in, back in, uh, I don't know, when I was 35, and I, I, I liked my, my, um, my cannabis, and I couldn't get any, and so I drank a lot of rum and coke, and then we went out to, um, this nightclub. Anyway, this is a bit sort of like this, but I didn't give up drinking until 10 years after this, but I don't drink anymore. Panda Mick sang a sad... Panda song, I've got no cannabis to put in my bong. I want to play and have some fun. So Panda Mick went out for a run. Panda Mick was fit and fine, so he bought a bottle of bamboo wine. He drank the wine, got pissed and drunk and started acting like a punk. <laughs> he made a comment as the waitress passed how he liked the size of her ass. <laughs> Security came and asked him to leave and he did something you wouldn't believe. Panda Mick smashed the bar window. Yeah, I did too. He ended in the lockup, you know. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Panda Mick got a real fright. He swore off drinking alcohol that night. Panda Mick went before the drugs. He'd given up. Uh, before the judge, he'd given up drinking alcohol and drugs. He was fined and paid for the window to be fixed. And never again did mm. Panda Mick get pissed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And um, great message. Yeah, yeah. So the the, the actual the, the end of the story is yeah, I got arrested, I put in the lock up overnight and the, eventually my partner and their friends found me about five thirty in the morning. <laughs> bailed me out and because I rang the bar window and I rang him and offered to pay for the window so his insurance didn't get and to fix and all of that and then I got um you know, I, I only ended up with um uh, a fine, yeah. So, yeah. How much did they find? No, <laughs> no conviction, 40 bucks. <laughs> yeah. 40 bucks.
crash it. Ten days down in Queensland. <laughs> it was in Queensland. That's what I was saying. All right, well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, you, you know you know about my 35-year-old, uh, yeah, gallivants when I, um, yeah, uh, couldn't handle my alcohol. Uh, yeah. Oh, it was rum, mate. It was rum. <laughs> ah, right, rum. It was a terrible <laughs> excuse, but it was. The rum um, story. Yeah. That's a yeah, terrible yeah, one, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I'm presented with a ruler. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, sure that's a ruler. Cat. No, it was rum and coke. Yeah, yeah it's a cat. That's it. Yeah. And he came in the storm. Yeah, it was probably <laughs> the fact that I had quite a lot. But, um, <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much, everyone. Um, out there on YouTube, Facebook, give it a thumbs up and a like, write a comment there and uh, share it around with your friends because I'm sure they might be interested in having a good laugh too. Thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see you later. Thank you. If you like it out there, at the bottom of the, of the thing in the description, there's a link to the GoFundMe. You can donate if you like. Yeah. I'll be going. Granite boulders, we're getting bolder. We are.